Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you happen to find yourself. Uh, my name is Carmen Mazera. I serve as Executive Director of APSIA, the Association of Professional Schools of International Affairs. It's so wonderful to see all of you as members of the PISA Public and International Service Advisor Network. We are always glad to be able to share with you lots of different resources and opportunities and ways for you to bring amazing opportunities to your students. This presentation is being recorded, so we'll have it up on the APSIA YouTube page just as soon as technology lets us. We have the amazing Mika Landau here to give us an overview of the PD Soros Fellowship and the tremendous opportunity it, it provides to your students to have funding for graduate school as part of their larger contributions to US society. We will be doing questions through primarily the chat. So if there's anything that comes in your mind as we go through, feel free to throw it in there and we'll get to those as soon as we can. If you have any technical issues, please feel free to contact me or my colleague, Brittany Chor, and we will be do our best to, to set you right. So with that, Nika, please, the floor is yours. Thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and it's uh, it's great to be here and um, and just connect with advisors because I know that you all have a connection to the students. And so um, while we love connecting with students every year, um, we're really trying to, uh, you know, the, the most important thing for us is to have people like you um, get, know about our fellowship. Um, so thank you for being on and for taking the time to learn more. Um, I, I also just want to say that your roles matter so much um, and the conversations that you have with our applicants, I know are often the tipping points for them. So it, 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 sometimes it's it's just one person telling someone, no, you should apply to this thing, which is what makes them apply. Uh, and uh, we hear that so often from so many of our fellows and especially fellows that don't come from sort of the uh, background where they've had a thousand advisors telling them to do everything. Um, they're just like, oh, this one person told me about it. And then they told me to do it again. So um, anyway, it's it's great to have you on and I appreciate it. Um, I would love to hear where you're coming, you're calling from. So if you could type in the chat, what state you're in, what school you're in, and maybe um, what your focus, the focus of your school is, that would be great. And if you have any questions, feel free to um, add them now, but I'll, I'll try to get to everything, um, as we go. And I see that, um, Elliot is on. So I invite, um, Elliot to, to turn his, uh, camera on. Hello, Nika. My, my sincere apologies. Uh, I had a no little problem. technical issue. It says I need to register and it, it really doesn't work quite well when I'm doing it from my phone. Oh, I, I'm okay. also, I, I, I feel even worse now because I do have to leave at 3.30, unfortunately, because my oh, advisor that's okay. advanced so, me. Wow. So I will, I will try my best to answer people's questions uh, if, uh, in the time I have, but I sincerely apologize. No uh, problem. Sorry. Uh, no uh, problem. Let me switch to... Uh, I'll let Brittany check in with you uh, offline um, and uh, you all can maybe work on that uh, if sure. possible, um, but we can hear you and now we can see you. So that's great. Um, so today I'll just quickly, th these are the things we're covering and then um, I want to introduce you to Elliot, who's um, a 2021 Fallen Daisy Soros Fellow, an immigrant from China, um, and he has his bachelor's from Emory uh, and was a Schwartzman Scholar and um, then went on to Princeton. So we're so glad to have Elliot on today. Um, I just wanted um, to have somebody on who could really share the experience of applying and provide any feedback to you um, in the sort of in the scope of the type of student that many of you are working with. Um, and it's great to see where you all are calling in from. And I'm very jealous of beautiful, sunny Seattle, because I think Elliot looks like he might be in the rainy Northeast with me. And yes. uh, it is I not, am. it's not beautiful. <laughs> um, so Elliot, um, would you, do you want to just take a second to introduce yourself and some of the points we went over in terms of your background and how you describe the fellowship? 
Sure, we'll do. Uh, well, uh, it's good to see everybody again. My my sincere apologies for uh, for, for this little time crunch and the uh, technical issues. Uh, my name is Elliot D. Uh, this is actually not the first. Uh, how do you guys pronounce this acronym? Uh, as uh, Absia. How do you, Absia. Yes, this is actually not the first time I've attended uh, a a uh, event at Absia. In fact, when I was an intern at Brookings in 2018, I attended a, a series of Absia events because I was considering going to a policy school after college. Uh, so it's really great uh, to to attend another one. <laughs> and I thank you for your uh, patience to uh, listen to me. In terms of my personal background, uh, my, my parents and I moved to uh, the States when I was a teenager. And we settled in New Jersey, so not very far from Princeton. Getting into Princeton, though, is a completely fortuitous uh, experience because um, I I didn't even apply undergrad. Um, but my interest in U.S.-China relations was basically um, uh, started uh, from my personal experience, you know, moving in, living in two countries, and uh, from the unfortunate uh, fact that I'm terrible at math. So I need to pick a major that can, uh, I can that, that I can actually be successful, and it happens to be political science. Uh, Emory has a terrific support system uh, for. Um, you know, someone who's interested in academic political science. So the research part, not necessarily the policy part. So it built a very strong foundation for my uh, later academic endeavors and allow me to look at policy uh, point um, from a very academic and uh, social science uh, perspective. So that really enabled me to do what I later wanted to do. Um, in terms of the actual substantive area, um, I try to focus on an issue that has a lot of impact in the world. Um, and one, I wanted to see. I wanted to see that political scientists usually are just notes in their books, you know, talking to academic audience using very fancy models. Um, you know, uh, it is how political science students are trained mostly uh, today, from my experience. But I really wanted to emphasize um, the potential policy intervention uh, that what we uh, that our work can bring. Uh, so I I wanted to uh, when I got to Princeton, I wanted to make sure that my work has a policy implication and that can actually be carried on and perhaps uh, perhaps leave some impact um, on the world. My experience applying to the fellowship, though, is a very interesting one. Uh, I was made aware of this fellowship when I first got into Emory, actually, in 2016. My, uh, my uh, fellowship advisor, Dr. Megan Friddle at Emory, mentioned that, you know, I, I know you're an immigrant, you know, maybe one day you can look at this. Uh, this is a very good opportunity. And uh, um, I, 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 I'm familiar with the story of Li Feifei, uh, who was one of the earlier recipients of this fellowship, uh, who also went to Princeton and lived in this area uh, during, uh, during her um, high school and Princeton uh, undergraduate time. So I've, I've had that fellowship in mind for a long time. And when, I was fin when it was found finally my chance to apply for it a year after Princeton, um, I recalled um, Dr. Friddle's suggestion and then talked to several friends who got the fellowship uh, from Schwarzman. Um, and one thing that I found that's very, uh, that I found very you know, important to me, in, in addition to the very generous financial support I got from the Soros family, uh, is how close net and how connected uh, people are when they have a shared immigration background. So not every immigrant uh, group in this country uh, has a culture that wanna send their first generation or second generation uh, child, children, uh, to work on policy related fields. Uh, from the Chinese community, I, I can say that uh, it's, it's very rare when you see a Chinese American working in politics or foreign policy, et cetera, um, because uh, the Chinese culture, especially parents who were born in the 50s and 60s were uh, disincentivized, I wanna say, um, to, to work on politics because of all the political turmoil, uh, turmoils in China uh, uh, they have witnessed. So it was a hard task uh, to, to find people who are in a similar interest and their parents who would support such an endeavor. Um, and for me, the, the fewer people do it, actually the, the more it motivated me to, to work on this uh, subject because I want to see whether in the US, there are so few Chinese American representation in the policy world because uh, there's some kind of lingering um, discrimination involved or simply people just don't try. So you artificially created this environment where they don't know much about this group, despite the huge potential um, this group can bring uh, to the US foreign policy community. So I just, I, I wanted to try and I talked to my friends and they, they really were, although even they're, although they're working in medicine or they're working in some technology or law, they were very much aware of this 
uh, situation where Chinese Americans don't get to, uh, to are, are, are not encouraged by their parents, I shall say, uh, to, to work on these fields. So um, we, immediately, we immediately clicked. And I think this is one of the most valuable things uh, being in the fellows community uh, is that you get to know your friends who have a very similar story very fast and you connect almost immediately because of shared experience. I may personally add that it's very hard uh, for me to find people who had a similar immigration experience, first generation, in the community I'm in. Uh, I, there are many international students who came to the States uh, to study in their 17s, 18s, but it's not every day you find people who moved here when they were teenagers or even younger and had to battle with the same difficulties that I, I had to contend with um, when I was 13, 14. So that's just my brief uh, intro, and I want to save some time for you to uh, address uh, questions about vacation. So thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Elliot. Um, that was really great, and I appreciate all of the context in there as well. Um, Elliot will be on until 3.30, as he said, so you're welcome to put questions in the chat if you have any for him directly. Um, and I'll try to move thing through things pretty quickly because I want to ask questions to Elliot as I go yes. um, in case there's things that could be helpful. Um, but, you know, I do want to just uh, back up and and give a brief overview. And as you can see, here's Fei Fei, who Elliot was mentioning, um, who is one of our alums. But um, you know, it's a our program is two years of funding or it, but it can be just one. So if somebody's doing a one year master's, that's possible. We're we're up for funding that. Um, and it's up to $90,000, which is a mix of stipend and tuition support. Uh, folks can apply while they're applying to professional or graduate school or in their first or second year. But let's say somebody was applying this year, they would need to be in school next year. So um, you couldn't be in a one-year program and apply this. Like if you had started the program this fall, you couldn't be applying uh, to our fellowship this fall because you would need to be enrolled next year too. Um, we have a fall conference um, where we bring all of the fellows together who are the uh, first and second years. Um, and we also have a campus visit that's part of our fellowship. So our director visits with, with each new um, fellow on their campus. Um, and we have many people who have done MPAs or MIAs and, um, and certainly lots of fellows in the public health um, field as well. So um, the background of the fellowship very briefly is that Paul and Daisy Soros, Paul Soros is the older brother to George Soros, were immigrants from Hungary. Um, Paul passed away 10 years ago and Daisy's actually, actually celebrating, I think her 94th birthday today. Uh, so it's a very special day for us. And it might be 93rd, I'm not positive. Um, so she's uh, still, she's very active in leading, leading the fellowship. And um, the, the fellowship is meant to honor their experiences as immigrants. They came to New York. Um, Paul had lived under uh, Nazism and communism in Hungary. And when he got to the US, he you know, had the classic story of $17 in his pocket and a camera. And because he was an amazing skier, he was able to get make his way through college and then um, go to graduate school. But um, it was pretty tough times for him and Daisy for most of his um, schooling. Uh, and unfortunately, it still is for so many graduate st school students um, across the country uh, here. So um, when Paul was, and Daisy were thinking about how they wanted to uh, commemorate their uh, or, or develop a, a philanthropy and com commemorate their own experiences. They thought it would be amazing to have something like the roads, but just for immigrants and children of immigrants. Um, and as Elliot said, there are so many different types of students in the fellowship, which is what makes it really special because we're honoring not just one type of field, not just STEM or, um, or music or, or the humanities, it's all of these different fields. So each year we select 30 people and we see them as examples of the richness that immigrants and children of immigrants bring to the United States. Uh, and the fellowship is $90,000, but again, as Elliot so eloquently said, um, it's really about so much more. We call this a lifelong fellowship. It's about the network. It's about um, having a community of people that is really thinking 
big and thinking about giving back and also who comes from the same experience um who you know as Elliot was talking about the challenges of studying policy from uh his perspective you know from somebody with his background um we see that in so many different fields and with so many different backgrounds and in so many different ways there's just unique a unique set of opportunities and challenges and um, people in our community have a really special um, understanding of those things and are there for one another uh, in a way that is, is really amazing. Um, a few other fellows um, that are in this space um, that uh, this is Carla, who's a 2001 fellow who did her MPA at UT Austin and is now working um, in uh, uh, policy in North Carolina. Um, Kevin Nazimi uh, is famous for founding Oscar, um, the healthcare company, and he's now working at renew.com, but he did his MBA and MPA. Um, Ankur Shah um, is a 2005 fellow who um, actually studied architecture undergrad in his undergraduate and then um, went on to get an MPA and has he started the Uber equivalent in the Middle East and it was actually bought by Uber um, and is he's um, now at a grocery store called We, which is doing um, delivery, but in a really interesting and, and specified way. Catherine is a 2015 fellow. Um, she went to Tufts and um, she's just actually about to leave her position, I think, at, as, at Libraries Without Borders, but, you know, very much in the nonprofit space in D.C. Um, and then, of course, on the larger stage, we have um, Nadine Burke Harris, who was the first um, Surgeon General of the state of California. She left her position um, uh, early this year. Um, Vivek Murthy, who's, well, it says former, but he's the U.S. Surgeon General again under President Biden, um, and Fei-Fei Li, who Elliot mentioned, who's in the artificial intelligence space. I, I, um, if I can mention one more, Dr. Vipin Naran, who got a fellowship, I believe, uh, in, the, or in the sometime between 2010, he's the principal deputy assistant secretary of defense for space policy. He's a professor yeah. at MIT in my field, working yes. on a nuclear ship. Yeah, yeah, Vipin. Um, we have so many fellows in this in the policy space, and actually, many fellows are now um, have joined um, the current administration. Um, so we have several um, several fellows who are who are working in DC um, at a pretty high level, which is really exciting. Um, but you know, the so I'd say, but I it what's so amazing is that, that some people study policy or they study and you know they they focus in on one area and then they really um and then they go on to start a company or they go do something else and then people who didn't study policy go into policy and so the network is really strong with people who are from all different backgrounds academically um so the fellowship uh, supports up to two years of study in any field at any advanced degree granting program. Um, you do have to be full time to be eligible for our fellowship and we don't support executive programs is the goal of the family was for everybody to really be able to sort of quit their job. And is this perhaps complete, you know, for Paul, that was really what he wished I think he could have done um, at the time that he was in school, just fully immerse himself in his studies. And um, this is a breakdown of the financial support, which I mentioned earlier. So part of it again is tuition and part of it is direct stipend. Um, and as I mentioned, there's two fall conferences that are required that um, where fellows go to New York City and really have a chance to get to know one another. It's a celebration, it's, it's really fun. Um, and then this is sort of the, the areas of what we're um, looking for. Um, and I will just say in terms of eligibility um, for your new American status, um, somebody asked, they have a student who is an immigrant to the US and one of their parents was born in the US, would she be eligible? And um, in this case, I will just answer this very specific question. Um, they would not be eligible because if either of your parents had access to US citizenship at the time of their births, 
then you would not be eligible. So um, if somebody is an immigrant and neither of their parents were born, you know, born in the U.S. and had access to citizenship, then they would be eligible. But because one of their parents was born in the U.S., um, then that this person would not be eligible. So, but just in general, we are open to people who have two parents who are um, immigrants and they themselves were born in the US or somebody like Elliot, who's um, an, an immigrant themselves and whose family either um, is undocumented, uh, never came to the US are green card holders, citizens. It can be a whole range of, of um, different statuses. And we are open to DACA recipients and um, folks who are undocumented, but went to high school and college in the US. Um, so I know Elliot's a little tight on time. So I wanted to just go over who we're looking for and talk about um, these criteria with Elliot. So um, th these are the main the main criteria: um, demonstrated creativity, originality, or initiative, sustained accomplishment, promise of future significant contributions, plan graduate training that's relevant to future goals, and commitment to the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Usually, I spend the most time talking about the commitment to the Constitution and Bill of Rights, but because of the nature of this fellowship. Um, almost all of the students you're working with really don't need to worry about this. Um, it's so obviously part of what they're studying and their backgrounds that we, even if somebody was studying uh, something, let's say something, you know, very particular in engineering, we still don't, we still typically recommend those students not even mention the Constitution or Bill of Rights. We're really looking to see, have you been committed to sort of broader broader themes and topics around this um, in your life. We're not asking you to write an essay about this, but for your students, they're they're certainly going to just sort of naturally write, you know, this is naturally going to be part of their resume, their essays, um, and what they're thinking about. So I would not worry about that, that last one. Um, so I'll just focus on demonstrated creativity, originality, or initiative to start that that does nothing to do with you know, instruments or art, we're looking for creativity in how you approach whatever your work is. Um, so Elliot, I don't know if there's an example you want to give from your background on, you know, maybe some way that you took initiative on something uh, sure. or, or had creativity in, in your work. Sure. Uh, so since I applied from a very academic background, so actually in terms of the uh, experience that I had, I actually am more similar to one of the, the medical school applicants, uh, just in a different social science setting. So you, you do have to utilize a lot of your creative power to do your own academic research, especially if you encounter an empirical challenge. Like in my case, I was doing a project that would reverse engineer censorship mechanisms in China. So you have to find a way that's causally sound and methodologically achievable to do this kind of experiment and still, you know, you have to get through IRB, you know, there's all these struggles that you have to do. So you have to design a method that will do it. So I think that will be an example of how you use your knowledge to showcase your creativity to serve a uh, to serve a research goal that, you know, in my case would be for the Constitution and Bill of Rights uh, under freedom of speech, um, but not necessarily as, as Mika ha has mentioned. So that's, that would be an example that I give to creativity. In fact, uh, I, just by talking to the fellows around here, people have no shortage of that in, in all walks of uh, disciplines that uh, they will bring to the fellowship. So you, you, as long as you're working on something uh, that, that want to have impact or as long as, well, as, long as you are uh, devoting your passion into something that you really care about, you know, I, I, I usually see that kind of creativity and originality just flow naturally from there because you genuinely care and you want to devote uh, all of your mental capacity to that particular cause or goal, uh, I think you people don't usually don't struggle to frame that. That just comes naturally uh, for them, even for someone who's working on a social science uh, project. Um, and uh, I also have heard this advice from, uh, from my more senior fellows is that um, the fellowship is really, it's not only about, you know, awarding achievements, it's also uh, about um, finding the, how that immigration story would help you or at least contributed uh, to the achievements uh, of the fellows. So a lot of these elements will go together and 
uh, all these fellows that I've known, they have such amazing stories, you know, no matter it's hardship or just unique experiences, um, that all, all of these elements that the fellowship would emphasize would just come naturally. Yes, very true. Um, and Elliot, do you want to um, head off now? I don't, I don't want to keep you beyond your time. So just let me know. When you, when sure. You uh, if there's one more thing you want me to address, I can yeah. do it very quickly uh, um, before I sign off. How about your biggest piece of advice for an advisor um, who might have a student who would be a good fit? Uh, I was think I will, I will encourage the student to think very hard about the immigration story that he's shared, not necessarily all his resume items. Because if you're invited to interview, the fellowship will consider you be a very impressive and certainly has the capacity to sustain your achievements. It's not the focus anymore. At that point, it's how your immigration story and how your background would help you to get to where you are. Uh, so uh, doing a lot of soul searching uh, will be very important. I recognize that not everybody uh, in, the, in the PD Source Fellowship were born outside of the U.S. and moved here when they were, when they still have a good, you know, when they can remember things. You know, some people were born outside of country, brought to the U.S. and a three-year-old, you don't remember much in your previous life, you just grow as an American. So for, for, for these applicants, um, I would recommend to really have several in-depth conversations with their parents, like to have that immigration story actually become part of their story too, because it is affecting them. You know, having immigrant, uh, immigrant parents, despite the fact that they are growing up in the States, uh, it just sometimes is not accessible uh, to to these applicants uh, if they were here. If they the, the, when they have the first memory, they're already in the states, you know, going to kindergarten or something. Right? You know, so um, uh, this is something I would recommend because uh, for if you move to the states at a later age, then you don't have to do that. You just go back to your memory, right? And then you you have the, your story. Um, I do have to go, but thank you very much. And I, I'm really sorry for my uh, limited uh, time here. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, direct them to Nika, and I can help in any capacity I can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Bye, Elliot. Bye. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Okay. Thank you all for uh, bearing with us. Um, we just were, we're always feel that having students on is the best way to talk about the fellowship and share what it's actually like to apply since we know um, it's different from our end. Um, but just to keep going through these um, criteria that um, sustained accomplishment and promise of future significant contributions are very similar. We're looking at the resume, we're looking at the essays and just trying to see a trajectory of someone who's giving back, again, who's taking initiative um, and who is interested in, in problem solving and, and contributing. Um, and this can be really different for different people. It might be graduating from high school is a major accomplishment. Um, and then graduating from college, that to us sustained accomplishment if that was not a guaranteed uh, thing for someone. Um, but you know, for other people, there might be um, research or internships or uh, uh, extracurricular activities papers that they wrote, uh, any anything um, that just shows they've been interested in, in the world around them. And we do see a lot of people making career shifts into graduate school. So it's okay if their past accomplishments or their creative endeavors are different from what they want to be working on in graduate school. We do want the planned graduate training to be relevant to their future goals. So if somebody tells us that they want to be in public health, we are going to be really interested in, well, why did you pick an MPP and not an MPH? Or um, why did you decide to go to business school but not a, do an MPP? There's so many different questions there. And um, I think sometimes people decide what degree they're going to get and they understand why they've decided that but you know if if they tell you what their career goal is sometimes you don't it it doesn't yeah you know, it there of course it makes sense but you need to explain it a little bit so um i always encourage people especially in this space to make sure that they aren't sort of taking that question for granted uh, i remember one student who was getting i think a phd in the humanities but wanted to go into policy and they really felt well the phd was going to give them the credibility that they needed to be taken seriously to make policy um but but there were so many other options that would take so much less time and allow so many other things in their life. 
So that was, you know, something that I really wanted to explore with a candidate. So just, um, yeah, don't take, you know, make sure students don't, don't take that totally for granted. Although that, I don't think that's often the, you know, make or break piece to any application. And then of course the commitment to the constitution and bill of rights, which we've already talked about, I think is so inherent in all of the programs that, um, you're, you'll be working on that. Um, I don't, I don't think you need to worry about that, but if for, if you were ever to be thinking about it, particularly, we really are just looking for people who are interested in being, good stewards, good citizens who are interested in grappling with the values of the Constitution and Bill of Rights. If somebody is going into public health, we're going to probably expect that they have a lens um, of thinking about systemic racism and thinking about systems of oppression and how that might have connected connection to medicine um, where, you know, if somebody hasn't, hasn't been thinking about many of those things, like that, that might, um, that, you know, we, we would be interested in, in how they're going to be making a difference and, and who they're going to be making a difference for. Um, but of course, there's all sorts of ways to be, you know, show a commitment to the Constitution and Bill of Rights. Maybe it's just taking part in a voter drive or a, a voter registration drive or um, working for somebody who's running for office or um, something really simple, like just, um, you know, uh, helping out around your community in thoughtful ways, the whole broad, broad range of things there. Um, just to go back to the eligibility piece, since I know we didn't get to talk about that, um, th this is the new American status piece. So, um, you know, you would have to be uh, born abroad as a non-U.S. citizen, and then one of these things must be true. You must be naturalized, be a green card holder, be adopted, have refugee or asylum status, or if none of the above is true, have graduated from high school and college in the U.S. So that's if somebody was born abroad. And if they're born in the U.S., then both of their parents must have been born abroad as non-U.S. citizens. So um, that's just to close a loop on, on that. Um, and we talked about academic standing, but um, you'd have to be planning to be going to graduate school um, full-time in the 2023-2024 academic year uh, to be considered. And I'm just not going to, I'll skip over the, that. Um, finally, with eligibility for age, we, um, you must be 30 or younger as of our application deadline. So the fellowship was, the founders were very focused on helping people at the outset of their careers. Of course, there's many people who do great things and are new Americans and pursue degrees later. Um, but our fellowship is really focused on, um, on this age group. Um, we do try to level the playing field since we have so such a diverse group of uh, people applying and everybody has such different opportunities um, grow, growing up. So uh, we encourage applicants to, especially if they haven't had a lot of opportunities, um, if they haven't had an opportunity to have an internship, we want to know what what were you doing? What were the accomplishments in your life that you were doing? So again, if you were um, graduating from high school and nobody in your family had done that before, that to us is something that maybe you want to put more emphasis on. Um, and so, or if you taught somebody English or you were the household translator, uh, those are things that we really think of as big accomplishments and would like to hear more about. Of course, they don't typically make it onto a resume, um, but we encourage applicants to, to discuss them. Of course, not everything, just some examples so that we really have a sense of where someone is coming from. We don't have any quotas. So um, you, when you look at a class of fellows, you're not going to see a perfect representation of anything. Uh, there's, there's no quotas on gender, country of origin, university, field of study, uh, you name it. Um, and uh, our applications are reviewed after the deadline. There's no rolling admissions. And we also um, re review the applications holistically. So if somebody picks up an application, they're going to read the whole application. Uh, there's no GPA requirement, no test score requirements, et cetera. Um, so the application has several components. And uh, the first is just basic 
background questions, uh, um, demographic questions. We do take privacy seriously, but um, anything that's shared with us will be most, for the most part, shared with a small group of readers and um, and then the panelists if somebody is interviewed. Um, but of course, people share their immigration status with us um, all the time. And uh, so nobody should be afraid, at least of our perceived perception of their status. Uh, and that is not something anybody has to worry about. Um, we do ask for a resume or a CV. This can be I, it's typically one to two pages, especially for somebody in, in this space, I would expect a one to two page resume. Um, one thing that I think is helpful on resumes that I, I've just recently been looking at some of our fellows and the fellows who have like a leadership space, like places where they just have like several leadership positions that they have. It's a really great way to show us some direct correlation between with our with our criteria um, and another, um, you know, if, or awards or, you know, things like that, like just having any, anything that you can break out like that um, is, is, is awesome. Um, you can be creative on the resume, although I don't see it a lot, but if somebody did want to, you know, add non, I don't know, sort of non-resume accomplishments, I'm sure that that would be welcomed. Um, so, uh, but th that's typically what we see for resumes. Transcripts, we're looking for just college, any college transcripts. Uh, if somebody went to community college and it's not listed on their um, full uh, full uh, transcript, then they can send that separately. Um, if somebody is already enrolled in graduate school, we'd like to typically see just a blank graduate school transcript or a, gra a graduate school transcript that has grades if they're in the first year or they've already completed a year. And that just shows us that, that, that they're in fact enrolled. Um, and the somebody just asked if the transcripts need to be official and they, uh, they do not need to be official. So somebody can just take a screenshot and then uh, upload the screenshot. And then eventually if somebody is uh, selected as a, a finalist, we, I think typically will ask for the official copies, but at this stage, we just want the path of least resistance. Um, test scores, if there is a required test for your graduate school program or the program they're going to, then we require that test. But if it's been waived because of COVID or it's not required and the student didn't take it, then we don't need it. I know that different schools in this space value the the standardized test score differently. So it might be required, but it's not necessarily something that's going to be a make or break for a student applying. So it, that's why we always say that these test scores are, we take, we, we take them, but we know that not everybody's studying for the GRE for hundreds of hours. Um, whereas students who are applying for medical school might really be focused on the MCAT because that's such an important component of getting into that program. So well, just if you talk to students who feel like, oh, I can't apply because of my GRE score or something, that that's not an issue or a reason not to apply for us. Uh, then for the essays, so this is really the heart of our application uh, along with, I would say, the recommendations. We have two essays. One is about your new American, ex the applicant's new American experience. And it's pretty open-ended. Uh, they can really share anything about their new American experience. And what I would just say to the applicant is tell your new American story. So reflect on what, what when somebody says, who are you as a new American? Just tell that story. Where were you born? Where were your parents born? Where were their parents born? Uh, if, if that is interesting. Um, and tell the migration story. If you yourself did not grow up in another country, talk about what it means to have had your parents grow up in another country and how that's impacted your life here in the United States. Uh, it, you, you know, what is your connection to, to that? And how has that shaped your experience here? How, is, how has that shaped what you want to do and um, how you see the values of the United States? Um, I think for a lot of fellows, there's a, a deep appreciation for American values, for the constitution, for the bill of rights, but there's also a deep understanding of how we don't live up to those values every day and how, uh, they are, they are working to ensure that those values are 
for everyone. Um, so there is, there's often a tension between deep appreciation and also the want for something much better for everyone. Um, there's, you know, there, so there's all sorts of themes that you can explore here. That's, that's just one option, um, or one, one area that you might get into. Um, I often tell applicants to think about like really specific memories that to, to bring people into their essay, because this should be a really personal essay. This should be something that's really specific to them. What did this air smell like when you first landed in the United States? What was the client? What was that climate like? Uh, you know, again, not things that you need to talk about, but those are helpful ways to jog your memory and perhaps open the essay or, um, you know, little things that you can, you can think about to orient the reader around where you're coming from and, and who you are. The second essay is much more straightforward and really just more of a standard admissions essay for graduate and professional school. What is it that you're hoping to do? Why are you going to graduate school? Um, if you if the student hasn't decided on a program, then they can talk about the things that they're interested in in a graduate program. Um, and then if they have chosen a specific program, they can talk about why they chose that specific program. Was it a professor? Was it a certain area of interest that the program has? Maybe the student is deeply committed to uh, Kansas, and I saw somebody from Kansas on, so, you know, deeply committed to Kansas, so they chose that university so that they could develop the best network and give back in that way. Um, so there's, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why pe people pick schools, family, you know, <laughs> money, whatever it is. So we, we just want to hear that. And then, you know, we're, of course, interested in how somebody is going to give back. And um, I think this is where a lot of new American students often have a hard time. There's a, a, a tension between humility and um, and real being realistic and also making money, of course, uh, for anybody. Um, but it's, it's okay to, um, I think in this, uh, way just dream, sorry, um, dream, you know, put the, put the biggest goal, um, possible, you know, for, uh, ahead in the essay. Um, so if, uh, or, or to not even put a specific job title or anything, but just say like, these are the areas that I really want to give back in. Um, I don't exactly know how I'll be doing that, but this, these are the questions that I'm interested in answering in graduate school and later through my career. Those I think are really compelling ways to handle the essay and to show that you're certainly going to be giving back. You, you, don't know how, or the applicant doesn't know how exactly, but, um, it, but they'll, they'll be doing, uh, doing big things. Uh, the, and then we have optional exhibits. So really this is for musicians, architects, designers to pr provide examples of their work, but we see optional exhibits from a lot of different types of applicants. So research papers, uh, if maybe somebody designed an app to provide public health benefits better or something like, well, sure, we'll take us, you know, take a screenshot and give a brief description of that. We'll take that as an optional exhibit. Um, maybe there was a, a newspaper article written about the student or about some of their work. This can, this is a really wide open space that students use in different ways. Sometimes students have hobbies that don't make it into the rest of the application, but they're really important to them and they want to share them. And that's always really neat and interesting to hear about. The, um, but they, this section can also be blank. It's totally fine if students don't want to provide anything. And then finally, recommendations. Uh, we look for three to five recommendations. We have plenty of successful applicants with three and plenty with four or five, but these should be people that are close to the student. They can be professional or personal or academic. Um, and we're interested in hearing, this is an amazing person. This is the person that you should choose. Here are several reasons why this is my experience working with them. Um, an advisor can often be a great recommendation to have, be, especially if you know someone sort of the, 
the full application, you can really help tie everything together for, for that person in, in the recommendations. Um, so I think that that is really, uh, you know, don't, if you can offer to be a recommender, that is really great. Um, and yeah, and then anybody that the person has worked with, I think is, is always really good. So colleagues, if the person has been in the graduate program that they're in for, um, a semester or two, then maybe somebody from the graduate school that knows them well, like a professor, uh, or an advisor. And if they're a recent undergraduate, then maybe an undergraduate professor could be somebody who would be who would be good if they have a pastor or a some sort of religious figure that they grew up with that is important to them then potentially that could be also a good um, recommendation maybe a teacher that they stayed in touch with all of these years we see all different types of, of recommendations we've seen teachers have students um, recommend them no, you never know what you're going to get. So, um, but the recommendations are really important and everything is due on October 27th at 2 p.m. Um, so uh, just, we do have a lot of different ways for uh, applicants and advisors to stay in touch with us and also to learn about how to apply best. So um, we have online guides on the apply page. We have a mailing list. Um, we, we mail out like a digest of all of the links or all of the news stories that fellows have been in every week, um, which may not be a super helpful resource for somebody who's applying, but we do have a monthly newsletter as well called the distance traveled, which, which would be more interesting um, for students. And then of course we're on all of these social media sites. And then these are the next steps we encourage students to take. So at this point, I'd love to open it up for questions. We have 10 minutes left. I'm sorry that Elliot couldn't stay on. Um, but if you want to uh, just unmute yourself and ask a question, that would be um, great. I'll just go ahead and see who's, wait, sorry. Nico, while we wait for our colleagues to, yeah. to find their fingers or, or their unmute button, yes. um, could you share a little bit more about that, the criterion for promise of achievement and how forward-looking that should be, how aspirational, um, and where students can find the line between wanting to conquer the world and, and looking for, for achievable goals and, and how you all gauge that, that balance between the two? Uh, that's a good question. I think that, um, I think that, let's see. We're, it, it depends a little bit on what somebody, on, on what somebody is focused on, but I think that showing that you're interested in asking questions and that you don't have all the answers can often be one of the best ways to approach the application in this area. Um, because you're it once you get to the interview phase you're you're going to be talking to somebody who is an expert in your field who truly has done whatever it is that you hope to do um or somebody like that will have read your application and i think that especially in the policy field where there's so many or policy at writ large you know uh there's there's so many questions that Sure, we have half answers to, and there there are working theses, but we don't necessarily have the perfect answer to anything. So um, I think that showing that you have a level of humility and that you're asking the question, you're asking the right questions, and you or you know how to ask the right questions, that can really be almost a a. I have, I think that can be a tool because I have seen people who's like, I'm my focus is. Uh, you know, the relationship with Russia, and I'm the expert on that. And it's like, well, sorry, but I, that it, it kind of, that it's not, it's not really interesting in terms of um, how you're going to be giving back in the future over the years. Whereas somebody who I think is interested in questions um, can take that philosophy and really, uh, use it to their advantage as their interests change and as the conversation changes. 
Um, but also in our application process, I think that works a little bit better. Like I'm really interested in this relationship and these are the questions I've been asking. These are all the things I've done, but, um, but I don't know, you know, I'm still, I'm still working on this, uh, I think is a, a good approach, but yeah, I think just, uh, in the essays talking about what they hope to work on, what dream jobs would be, um, it, that's a good way to give us a sense of what you're, of what you're hoping to do. And certainly talking about things like representation, would you be the one of a few people from your background to be working on a certain type of issue? Um, or uh, would you be helping a certain population with something that typically they have not received help on? That could be real. that could be a, a great um a great thing to know. Of course, the, again, these are not things that are, you know, is go, it's not going to get any person in the fellowship to have one of these things, but, um, but it's helpful to, again, just contextualize your promise of future success, because it's different from somebody else who might have a really similar resume or experience. Um, yeah. So I guess those are some of my, my thoughts on, on that. That's really helpful. So even if Vivek Murphy had not written, I plan to be the uh, Surgeon General yeah. twice, he, he could have talked about the, the role of the Surgeon General in larger public health questions. Yeah, and well, and I, I think what we always say is like, we don't know what any of our fellows are going to do. And we we really have no idea. Fei-Fei Lee went on to start, you know, she created one of the most ingenious artificial intelligence foundational tools that we have in the world. I don't think anybody was smarter than Fei-Fei who interviewed her. So they just knew like that this person was asking the right questions and that's what they saw. Um, because that, that was 1999, the internet, you know, was barely a thing at that point. And Fei-Fei was, I mean, she, she would have been on the cutting edge, you know, today with what, what she was thinking about. So I, I just think that, um, it's, you know, we know that everybody is still really early in their career and that they're, you know, there's no way they know what they're going to be doing. And if they do, I think that's almost more of a red flag than it is a, uh, not, not necessarily, but you know, you don't want somebody who's totally certain about their path because that's the whole point of graduate school is that you have lots of questions to answer. Indeed. Colleagues, any questions that you'd like answered before we let Nika free? She kindly shared her email in the chat as well. Um, and you have all of her cha their channels to follow their stories. Yeah, that's great. And I um, I really am happy to join anybody at their university. If you have a group of students who might be um, interested, I could record a session for you. If you're, let's say you have a group of students in a certain field, I could try to find a fellow um, who might be able to uh, do a session with me and, and you. So I'm happy to um, meet you wherever you are on the internet and, um, <laughs> and, and do that. Um, but, you know, we really are interested in having more students, um, from, you know, these spaces. And, um, I know that we have so many Ivy league institutions represented in our schools, and it's not because we think those are the best schools necessarily. It's just, we have the most students from those schools applying. Um, and of course they are great schools. So they do, they do really well in our process, but um, it's, it's not a reflection of necessarily where the reviewers are in terms of what their preferences are for schools and certainly not where we are as an organization. So um, if you have students from other schools who are great, like, like, you know, let me know how I can help them. I would love to help them um, do well in the process. And, and um, I'm here for you to, you know, make, make sure you are able to advise as, as best as possible. And I know that connections with students like Elliot or other current fellows can be really helpful. So I'm, I'm also happy to, you know, try to facilitate those as, as much as possible. But thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and uh, I appreciate everyone on this call and I'm excited about the work that you're doing. Thank you. We're so grateful for your time and, and this opportunity that it uh, provides to students. And likewise, we hope to welcome many more Soros fellows at APSIA schools so that we can continue to, to work on some of those policy challenges. 
Colleagues, we hope we'll see you at a future APSIA webinar for advisors. We have lots more planned for this fall so that you can get your questions answered and, and build out your set of knowledge about the opportunities for your students. And as was said, uh, we hope to continue this conversation and we hope that, that you will be able to build your relationship with PD Soros as well. This recording will be available on APSIA's YouTube page by the end of today. And you have her email if you'd like to follow up and continue to build that relationship. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks to Nika, thanks to the fellowship, thanks to Elliot, thanks to Brittany Chor, thanks to all of you. And we'll see you at a future APSIA webinar. Take care, everyone.